Okay, good. Um, anyway, let's get started. Otherwise, we have schedule issues. So, um, uh, TTCN3. This is a, a generic introduction into TTCN3 and Eclipse Titan, which is hard to do in 30 minutes, but still I'll try my best. Um, afterwards, we will talk a bit about what we do in Osmocom and what are our test suits and what this, what's the state of those test suits. Um, so, um, why are we doing protocol testing? Well, of course, we're doing this because um, uh, we want to ensure conformance to uh, some specification. We want to ensure interoperability with other equipment. We want to um, uh, well uh, have test for security-related aspects. We want to test for regressions. Um, uh, and last but not least, also for performance of implementations. And uh, there's no standard methodology, at least not that I'm aware of, or language, or approach, or tool. Um, you can, of course, if it's a symmetric protocol, you can test the protocol against itself. Uh, like, let's say, with TCP, it's easy to test TCP against itself. Um, not so much for a lot of the telecom protocols, which are asymmetric. Um, but, uh, well, the problem is, of course, you don't see a lot of the problems because you, uh, let's say, you, you interpret your NDNS wrong in your implementation and it still works against your own, but it doesn't work and interoperate with anyone else. Testing against Wireshark is also not a good idea because Wireshark most, more, more often uh, than not is buggy, um, uh, particularly when it comes to uh, uh, the kind of protocols that we deal with. Um, so, uh, if you think, uh, uh, oh, it's, it's correct because Wireshark decoded it or shows it correctly, always um, uh, verify that this is actually true. Otherwise, you can spend uh, hours or days uh, in, in uh, believing that something is correct, but maybe it isn't. Um, yeah, of course, people do custom implementations of test suits and test protocols. Python is a very popular language in that area. Um, Scapy, for example, is a tool that's used quite a bit uh, originally from like security testing, fuzzing kind of background, but you can uh, implement basically any kind of protocol and protocol stack uh, and, and that. Um, also, I think Erlang is a nice fit because you have a, a good uh, binary encoder decoder and a, a, a nice syntax how to describe uh, binary protocols in there. Um, then there are tools like Packet Drill. I'm not sure who has heard of Packet Drill ever here. Nobody. It's, uh, I think, originally developed by Google, um, and it's used a lot to test Linux kernel. Um, and it works in a way that you can basically, there's a specific output of TCP dump, so it's very much TCP IP oriented, of course, but there's a specific output format of TCP dump, um, and basically you can specify uh, scripts of packets in the same syntax. So you can literally copy and paste some parts from, from a specific wire, uh, not wire shark, TCP dump output, and you can then save that in ASCII form, and it will basically regenerate uh, flows uh, based on, on uh, this uh, description. Um, yeah, but it's uh, TCP IP, so not very, uh, very much uh, uh, oriented to other protocols like the ones that we are dealing with. So, well, I don't need to tell you about this. this I use these lights in other contexts. I mean, you know that I've been doing uh, telecom-related stuff. Um, and uh, TTCN3, every so often I read about TTCN, not specifically 3, uh, in some specs, uh, and uh, I did some research uh, and uh, basically always discovered, well, it's, it's not interesting because there's only proprietary tools and those are not accessible, so it wasn't possible to, um, uh, to do anything with it in, in free software world. Um, so, yeah, uh, the TTCN3 language is a domain-specific uh, programming language, and it was just specifically made or created for doing protocol conformance tests. History goes back to the 80s, so it shares something with GSM there and a lot of the other telecom protocols. TTC in 3, the third incarnation, exists uh, since about 2000. And um, it's used apparently uh, quite extensively in the classic telecom sector. So um, it's uh, used in, uh, for example, in uh, you can find papers uh, where Nokia publishes how they test their SGSN uh, with it, or you can find other papers from Ericsson, how they test all their core network in elements using uh, uh, TTC and three test suits that they have created. So uh, based on conference papers and publications, you can see that this is used extensively, but not in a very public way. Um, Etsy has specified, uh, has published a couple of uh, so-called abstract test suits. That's a set of tests. 
Um, written in TTC and 3 for a number of protocols, which many people are not aware. There's a quite comprehensive IPv6 uh, test suite, for example, which you can use to test an IPv6 implementation. The same goes for SIP, diameter, uh, electronic passports, so the, the protocols you use uh, um, with machine-readable travel documents, uh, digital no mobile radio, um, of course, with uh, LE and not EL. Um, uh, so DMR has a, an abstract test suite uh, published in TTC and 3, also for 6 low pan, for example. So there are many, as you can see, in, in different areas, uh, not just telecom, electronic passports are clearly not a telecom uh, a protocol. Um, but there are also some other uh, specification bodies that have tested, uh, have, sorry, have published test suits. Uh, so there's some Autosar stuff, some MOST, MQ, is this automotive sector, or MQTT and COAP and so on. Until 2015, though, only proprietary compilers existed, which reflects my previous experience, and uh, it was uh, basically out of reach for us. Um, in uh, 2000 already, Ericsson internally developed a TTC and 3 toolchain, that's compiler and runtime and executor and so on, um, which they have ap apparently used quite a bit internally. And of course, not a lot of details are known, but some papers have been published. Uh, this used to be commercially available proprietary software. Um, they, had, uh, they also licensed this to third parties, so it was an Ericsson product that you could license uh, as an external entity. Um, and uh, it's about 300,000 lines of Java and 1.6 million lines of C++, so it's a quite uh, a comprehensive uh, product. And in uh, 2015, they released this as uh, open source software under the Eclipse Foundation under the umbrella of the Eclipse Foundation, doesn't mean uh, that you need uh, to use an Eclipse IDE to develop with it. Um, and uh, it's not just the compiler, but it's, uh, this includes lots of documentation and uh, lots of protocol modules, which we'll come to in the Osmocom context, uh, as well as so-called test ports. There's also a module for the Eclipse IDE, but I've, I think I used it one day or so, just to, to you know, use some of the examples they published. Um, there's the log file viewer and filter and analyzer and uh, a parallel test executor. So you can even um, run distributed tests across many nodes in a network and uh, the Eclipse uh, test executor will take care of starting all the different processes on the different machines and uh, running them and aggregating the results back and so on and so on. So finally, we can use TTC and 3 in uh, open source software. Um, how does the, work the, the workflow look like? Um, well, first we have a human developer that writes some code in TTC and 3 in this programming language, uh, which results in the creation of what they call an ATS, an abstract test suite. Um, the abstract test suite is compiled by the TTC and 3 compiler into C++. So you generate uh, from TTC encode, you generate C++ <laughs> code. Uh, you can then, of course, link in some other uh, C or C++ stuff that you have around. So if you have maybe some existing implementation for implementing a checksum algorithm or something like that, you can just link those functions in and use them. Uh, and then uh, you, you, you have the C++ code that you just use normal GCC or G++, and I'm quite sure you could also do uh, uh, LLVM Clang uh, stuff if you wanted to. It's just C++. Um, and then you get a binary executable in the end that you can execute. So uh, this means it's not an interpreted language, it's not a scripted language, it's a strongly typed compiled language, and strongly typed is extremely useful in testing because you don't want uh, a lot of errors only to show up during execution, but you want to make sure even before you compile it or while you compile it that um, it, it will work. And um, it's uh, so very different from, from a Python experience uh, in that sense. Um, uh, the, 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 the terms uh, they use is ATS, the abstract test suite, that's the source code, and the ETS, the executable test suite, but well, I mean, acronyms everywhere, but we know that. So. What's, in, what's uh, um, interesting language features? We have a comprehensive type system. Uh, what does that mean? We will look into it. Uh, we have parametric templates uh, because what do you do in protocol testing? You do encoding of messages and uh, decoding of messages and matching received messages against how those messages should look like. So you have some expectation about what you receive and you can match against that. You have an automatic and uh, comprehensive logging framework that will um, uh, basically, uh, um, uh, you don't need to explicitly uh, log some stuff. That's very rare, actually. 
um, because at lots of events the test suite will automatically log everything interesting, so you don't need to uh, do much there. Uh, it has a built-in notion of test cases, test suits, of verdicts as a result of tests, um, and as I said, you have this runtime executor that uh, takes care of starting that. So what kind of types do we have? Of course, the usual suspects such as integer, uh, uh, float, boolean, uh, with an A, of course. Um, we have uh, then some more interesting types such as bit strings, octet strings, hex strings, uh, character strings, uh, um, universal character strings. Um, from those elementary types, we then can build uh, constructed types or structured types such as a record or a set. A record is like a C struct basically. Uh, a set is any arbitrary order, so you can permutate the order of the elements and they will still be equal. Um, you have uh, a record of which is an array and a set of is again um, um, well, uh, the same for the set. Um, the verdict type is quite interesting because it's basically a, a, a built-in type um, that can only get worse and never get better. So uh, you, uh, have, uh, you run a test and um, you say well um, the verdict is pass or fail or error or whatever and um, if you ever set, if any part of the code ever set it to fail, even if it didn't terminate the test at that point, um, any later code that would say, oh, verdict is passed, is just completely ignored because somebody else has already said fail. And each component, and they speak of parallel test components, which you can think of processes or threads, all of these, each, each component has their own verdict and uh, all the verdicts get aggregated and of course the, the worst verdict wins so you always get the, the, the uh, result of what was the, the worst uh, basically from those. Structure types, well it's just like a, a structure types in any other language. Uh, you can basically have fields, uh, what's in, uh, so you have a record constructed of three fields, integer, here an integer field and, and character string and a boolean field. Um, what's interesting here is that you have an optional notation, so you can say this can be there or it cannot be there, and you can even further specify conditions and so on in which this uh, might uh, be needed in encoders and decoders. Um, you have unions, of course, so here we have a union from uh, an integer and a character string, and the nice part compared to C or C-like languages is that uh, you don't have to have an explicit uh, information which of the union members is chosen. So in C you would normally have a union and then a struct uh, encapsulating the union with a field, an enum or an integer that tells you which of the union elements have been chosen. And here in Titan this is built in, so um, you have an in a built in fun a function called is chosen, so you can match on uh, if is chosen uh, union.field1 and then you have some, some uh, code handling that, so that's uh, built in. Um, also we have um, a way to prevent ever using uninitialized uh, fields or uninitialized uh, memory uh, because all the, all the variables or fields in structure types are always assigned uh, unbound value. It's a, it's a magic value called unbound. And if you ever try to send uh, something that has any part of it unbound, so you have a, a structure or a record and you send it uh, to some remote site, um, if there's any field that's unbound, then uh, it will uh, crash basically at that point and tell you that you try to send something that is not bound. So you can never use uninitialized uh, variables or structure members. Um, uh, if you want, uh, in these optional cases, if you want to say, well, this element is not to be sent, then you say omit. You basically assign the magic value omit to that variable or to that field, and that will tell the Titan runtime that it's intentional that you do not want to send this particular element or variable. Um, so uh, that's uh, the case. You can subtype, so you can say, well, I have an integer that goes from 1 to 100, and if ever somebody tries to assign a value that's different, it will crash. Um, uh, you can have the same for characters, you, for, for, and it, you can combine lists or ranges with, with uh, discrete values. So uh, you can say uh, there's an integer that can be 1 to 5 or 7 or 9. Um, you can uh, have length of, uh, so this is basically, a, 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 you define um, a record of 0 to 10 numbers of integers, uh, like an array, a variable length array, with, which can zero, have 0 to 10 elements, and you call this new type rec of int. Um, you can basically say, I define a, a character string that must have a carriage return line feed at the end, 
and things like that, which is very useful, again, uh, because any violation of these uh, uh, type definitions would basically create um, failures either at compile time, if it's already known, or then at runtime uh, when you go to that, uh, come to that point. Um, in uh, templates, uh, that's basically the one really strong concept of the language. Um, in templates allow you to, um, uh, in both ways, to either send, uh, or, or uh, the so-called send templates and receive templates. Um, the receive templates, I think, the more obvious uh, of the two. Um, so sending a message, typically it's quite easy. You know all the field values that you put in, but when you receive messages, um, then it's, um, you know, sometimes you, some fields are wildcarded because the remote end that sends you the packet is choosing some transaction identifier or some other value that you, you don't, as the test case, you don't know which exact value will be chosen, but some other fields you know. So let's say in, in TCP uh, or whatever, yeah, uh, you, you would, well, you know what kind of TCP flags you expect from a packet, but you don't know what's the timestamp of the packet. Maybe for the timestamp you only know a range or you have a wildcard or something. And using those templates, you can basically uh, define such rules on what exactly uh, how uh, a packet should look like. And then you have a match operation and you say, if this uh, packet matches the template, then do that or whatever. Um, so um, you, you can furthermore extend the templates by uh, arguments, the so-called parametric templates. So we can say here, for example, we have a TR is just a convention for a receive template. So template receive, uh, that's a complete convention only. So we can say, well, it has to be A, B, or C. And then you can match any uh, uh, character string against that and will only match in that case. Uh, you can have something like, oh, a, a value that's near uh, pi, but not exactly. Um, or uh, something that would fit in one byte because it's 0 to 255 as an integer. Or you can uh, have like, positive integers, negative integers, with or without zero, or whatever you, you may want. And here again, you have something like you say, zero to 127 or 200 or 255. And you can do that, of course, also with much more complex uh, types. For binary uh, matching or for bit matching, uh, we have the bit string. Bit strings can have any arbitrary number of bits. So you can have a, a three bit long bit string or something like that. Doesn't have to be uh, uh, octet aligned. And you can say, well, I want to match on something that starts with a known pattern, but the last two bits, are we don't care. Um, and you can express uh, this like that. Or you can say uh, with, with the character strings, you can use some matching, even regular expressions at that point. So, um, uh, and then you have some more uh, interesting capabilities where you can match on permutations of something or a subset or a superset of things, or um, you can have conditions in there and so on, uh, which I'm not covering here in this uh, simple example. So how does a parametric template look like? Let's assume we have this record again. We had this before on a slide. We have uh, three fields, integer, character string, and Boolean in a record. And now we define a template. We say the template uh, relates to the my message type, which we have defined up here. And we call it trmutimplete. <laughs> and um, we have a, a Boolean parameter that we uh, uh, put in here. This is the, the parametric part of the template. And we say field one, it must be present, but can have any value. That's question mark. It's a bit like, like, like DOS. Uh, no, DOS was single character. Anyway, but that's question mark. And asterisk would be, can it be not present or present and have any value? Um, and field two can be B, O, or Q. And field three must be the parameter that I pass here into the parametric template. So. And you can, of course, from that simple example, you can create quite complex constructs. Um, and um, so, and you use this either by explicitly calling the match function that I expressed, but also we will uh, see uh, soon um, there's a concept of so-called test ports, and uh, you can uh, send and receive on such test ports. And a receive statement, you can directly give a, a, a template. So the receive statement would ever only return if what it has received matches uh, the template that you have provided. So the explicit call to the match function you almost never need. Uh, it's, it's uh, yeah, I think 95 to 99% of the cases you don't need it. So yeah, you can, hierarch you can have hierarchical templates. So you can say, well, I have a template that matches any message type um, here. And then I can say, well, I have a template 
uh, for message type 23 that modifies the other template and it inherits all the fields that you have specified here but you can override some fields in your specific template. So you can start from a very generic one and you can create more specific and more specific templates um, uh, that you can then use in, in matching. Now the, the next part is of course how do we encode and decode data because all the protocols have whatever kind of e encoding, decoding. Some of them are in ASN1, some of them are uh, just human readable specified, maybe they're ASCII based, they're text based or they're binary protocols. Um, but uh, uh, TTCN3 specifies um, how you can import some uh, sh formal schema definitions. So if you have an ASN1 protocol, it's very easy. You can just, uh, the TTCN3 compiler can just compile the ASN1 files and we generate C++ for that. So you don't even need to do anything it's just uh, you have your TTC and three files and your ASN files and you throw them at the compiler and it will generate code for it. Nothing to worry about. Um, for other um, uh, formats such uh, or like formal descriptions such as XML schema definition or JSON uh, schema uh, definitions also is the same. You can import it rather easily. Um, but for all the other protocols like uh, the legacy GSM stuff that we deal with, which are all not specified in a formal syntax, um, there is the raw codec uh, that you can use for binary protocols and the text codec that's uh, for, for text-based protocols. Those two are Titan-specific extensions of TTCN3. You will not be able to use them with other tools, but since there are no other open source tools, we are not really worried about that. Um, and the codecs now express how do you get from a concrete binary or on the wire encoding to an abstract representation of this uh, that Titan can deal with and vice versa. And um, the nice part about this is that you do this declaratively. So you never, uh, like in C or in, in, in other languages, you would normally write, uh, okay, if the first byte is that or that, then do whatever, blah, blah, blah. So you have an, a, an imperative description of how the parser encoder works, but with Titan, it's a, a declarative description. So what does that mean? Well, if you look at the UDP header definition, this may look a bit weird if you think, okay, well, in C, I just uh, have one struct uh, that has a couple of uh, uh, unsigned integers. So this is a bit more complex. But, of course, this works for even the most complex protocols um, uh, uh, and not just for something that maps very nicely to a C struct. So we first define uh, an integer uh, that uh, is basically 0 to uh, 64K and we define it has a 16-bit field length, it has no sign bit, and it has a last uh, uh, a byte first uh, field order, uh, byte order in there. You can also specify a bit order and, and all kinds of things. So we first define us basically what's a U in 16T in, in, uh, in, uh, in network byte order. Um, and then we say, well, the UDP header has a source destination port, a length, and a checksum. And we define the field order is uh, MSB, which basically means it starts with this field in, in, in the struct. Uh, not from the bottom up. Um, and then we define a UDP packet which has a UDP header in front and an octet string as payload. And then we say in the header, um, actually uh, we have the length of header and payload together we store in the len field that's a member of uh, the, the UDP header. So basically you can declaratively express that there is a length field and it covers this part of the packet um, and both the encoder and decoder will use this. So if you ever send a packet, you never have to, to specify the length, the encoder will do it. And if you receive a packet, the decoder will use the length value from there and it will truncate. Uh, so if let's say the packet is longer than the length value, it will truncate and will give you a warning that there's uh, data remaining while you're decoding the binary data. Um, if you look at a GTP header, that's now more um, a telecom example. Um, you can say, well, okay, we have, um, so this bit one uh, and oct two and so on, all these types you first have to define, uh, but there's some, some normal header files that you just include. So you have, uh, let's say, a, a checksum present bit, uh, a RT present, I don't remember what this is, or a key present bit. These are basically bits that indicate the presence of other optional fields here. Um, and then you basically say, well, the checksum field, which is defined here, has a presence condition of either C sum present is one or RT present is one um, and something like that. So you, again, you describe uh, and you declare how your message is formatted and then it will uh, basically create the code for parsing and uh, encoding the data according to the description. I think this is 
extremely nice. Uh, I'm surprised that we don't have such features in, in other uh, languages or tools. At least I've never seen anything like that. Um, and it's extremely comprehensive because you can even express something like um, um, pointers. If anyone has ever looked at how SCCP is uh, implemented, you actually have relative byte offset pointers to other optional fields in the message. You can express that in there um, and uh, all kinds of other craziness uh, that you can do. The same exists for text-based protocols. Um, uh, so this is MGCP, which of course we have in Osmocom, as we heard yesterday. And uh, I can define uh, the different um, uh, parts of the, the protocol here this way. So I say, well, a transaction ID is a, is a, is a number with decimal digits uh, with length of one to nine bytes. And I say an MGCP endpoint is something that has to have an add character somewhere. The version number has two decimals uh, inters interspersed with a, a dot in the middle. And um, it has to begin with MGCP at the string. So, um, and then I com use these uh, elements and I compose basically uh, the, the MGCP command line from that. As I say, well, the field separator between the individual fields can be a space or it can be a tab, uh, a, a multiple tabs or multiple spaces or a combination of multiple tabs and spaces. And the entire MGCP command line must end with a CRLF or, um, well, an inverted CRLF with uh, um, in opposite order and so on. So you express all these things and then you can just throw an MGCP message at it and will completely decode it in an abstract um, representation. Um, program control statements are just like any other language. Uh, so if you're coming from C or C++ or Java or Python, it's not really going to be uh, a surprise you have just the switch statement becomes select for whatever reason, um, but otherwise you have if, else, for, while, do, while, go to, labels, even go to, break and continue. Um, now we have these abstract communication operations, which mean, well, we need to exchange data somehow with uh, our implementation under test. And TTCN3 introduces a concept of test ports. This is not a TCP port or a UDP port or a socket or something. It can map to one but it's a much more abstract concept. You can think of it like uh, pipes or yeah, some, some method by which one part of a system can exchange data with another. Um, and um, you have a send and receive operation. The send operation is always non-blocking. So there are queues inside that will uh, basically uh, enqueue the message. And you can send any literal value constant, any variable, any specific value template, and so on. Um, the receive operation is uh, normally a blocking receive operation. Um, so it will block until it has received something that matches the template that you have specified. Um, and again, you can specify, uh, uh, of course, literal values. So that's uh, not so, but the, the template is, is the real, a really nice part that you can do. Uh, but the problem now is, of course, well, if the receive blocks, how can we wait for any n of different events? Excuse me. And that's where uh, some interesting um, program control statements and behavioral, they call it behavioral statements come in, um, uh, which uh, can do all kinds of um, uh, interesting things. And look at an example here. Well, uh, you say basically, if you have a code like this, p.receiveX and p.receiveY, these are sequential and blocking statements. So basically, the first statement waits until the whatever matches x appears on the top of the, the queue of p, and then you do receive y. But what if the two receive in opposite order, then you block indefinitely. So that's not very useful. So that's why um, the alt statement is introduced. So you can basically say, this is an example, well, I'm sending some request to some implementation, I'm starting a timer, and then I have this alt statement, which means, well, either we receive something that matches our response template, or we receive anything else or the timeout happens, and then I have clauses that specify what happens in these respective cases. And this uh, square brackets at the beginning is a guard condition. People coming from Erlang will know what that is. Um, uh, basically, it enables or disables this particular uh, alternative based on some value, which is really nice for state machines. So you can say, well, this line only applies if the state is such and such uh, in your state machine, and, uh, and so on. Um, now. That's nice, but still it's rather explicit. So you have to write a lot and you always have to start a timer and handle the timeout and so on. So that's, um, uh, okay, first before we go there, sorry, is one more slide about the repeat statement. So basically in the normal else statement, we will execute that section and then continue at the bottom. So 
Basically, the first um, alternative that has arrived will be executed, and then the co program flow continues after the entire alt block. Um, the repeat statement is basically uh, something to prevent that. So um, let's say you have a protocol where you have some requests and responses, and at random intervals, the other side also sends you a keeper live request, and you need to respond to that. So we send a request, we start the timer, we want to receive a certain response. But if we receive a keeper live, then we send some response or whatever, and we repeat, which means we start again at the alt statement. So that happens in between, but it doesn't affect our uh, actual test logic that uh, is being performed. So you can uh, use repeat for that. Um, interleave is now an alternative uh, to, uh, or is, is a different uh, behavioral statement, um, which basically means um, I have these three events that all should happen, but I don't care about what the order is. So each of those must happen exactly once, uh, but they can happen in any order. We don't care. And that's uh, what you can express here. And then in, in asynchronous telecom stuff, that's actually fairly common uh, uh, behavior because you, you know some things need to happen. Let's say authentication must happen at some point, but uh, the spec doesn't say when exactly the authentication has to happen. But somewhere in the overall transaction, authentication at some point must happen. And then you can use the interleave statement for such um, uh, situations, which will guarantee that each of the events has happened once, uh, but uh, all of them have happened. Um, now, as I said, it's a bit verbose, because if in every small part of the code you have to start a timer and explicitly handle the timer, uh, it takes quite a lot of lines of code. Um, this is where alt steps come in. So an alt step is... Um, a sort of part of an alt statement that you can abstract out and share and reuse. So uh, we define here an alt step, like a function definition, but it's not a function, it's an alt step, which says, well, if we receive a ping from the other side, we send a pong, or if the guard timer times out, then we set the verdict of the test case to fail with this description. So the test fails if the time out is happening. So we define this my alt step. And then the my alt step can be used in any other alt statement. So we say, well, we send something. Um, and if we receive whatever, we do whatever handling. But we can also execute the my alt step. And then we don't need to repeat all the lines that we have in this alt step in every of our alt statements in the, in, in the code. So we can abstract that away. And it even goes further. We have so-called default alt step activation, which means we can basically say, uh, at some point in our code, we can say, well, activate this alt step ping pong. And then this will basically become uh, a background action that will happen all the times in any, uh, in any um, receive statement or any other alt statement. So if I do something like this, then uh, whenever my code at any point receives uh, uh, something that matches TR ping, we will send a TR pong in response. But we don't have to handle this in all of our code anymore. We can focus on, on the actual logic of the test and all the default stuff uh, is a default activation. Um, code in TTC and 3 is uh, written in so-called modules, a bit like Python modules. They also have import statements. The syntax is slightly different. And a module consists of definitions that contain um, a so-called control part or um, um, uh, other elements. Uh, such as uh, module parameters. Um, and whenever you declare something not as a normal variable, but as a module parameter, then it automatically sort of appears in your config file for the test suite. So if you want to have a certain value configurable, let's say an IP address of your device that you want to test, um, you don't have to manually somehow make that configurable, but you just move your variable that holds the, uh, the IP address in this special module parameter section and then um, if you execute that, uh, oh, sorry, if you run the module, um, uh, you can specify a config file. In the config file, you can override all the variables that have um, uh, this, um, uh, on this module parameter part. Uh, you define your data types, your constants, your templates. Uh, you define your communication ports and your actual test components, uh, your functions, your alt steps, your test cases. And all of that together then builds modules. And you can import definitions from other modules. You can also have um, private um, uh, alt steps or private functions that cannot be imported into other uh, modules. And you have something that's a little bit um, like uh, inheritance, but it's not. So it's not an object-oriented language, but you have something that's 
a little bit like inheritance. So you can basically uh, say uh, some component extends another component and it will basically inherit all, well, inherit, uh, all the uh, fields and definitions and so on of another module, but you can extend them. Um, so it's a bit like poor man's inheritance. Okay, real world examples. Let's uh, quickly look at that. Um, I think we are running out of time by far. Um, so let's uh, quickly try to um, look at some code. Um, and we look at, talk about the Osmocom side anyway in, in a short time. So let's look at, I don't know, the BTS test suite, for example. Um, so if we look at the BTS test suite, we will, well, this color is not uh, matching well with the daylight here, so um, I'm switching off syntax highlighting. So yeah, you see lots of import statements, all the different things we import, um, and so on and so on. We see this module parameter section, that's what, oh, set no spell. Uh, that's what uh, I described. So basically we define, we have a character string module parameter RSL IP and the default value is this. But you can basically just in the config file specify that and it will override the compiled in default. Um, so this is how you make parts configurable and so on and so on. But let's look at an explicit test case. Um, so here we have uh, uh, a function that tests uh, unit data indication. Um, and uh, we basically have some helper functions that detune the layer one control. In this case, uh, we clear the RSL receive queue, we transmit some labdm frame, and then we have an alt statement which says, well, if we receive on the RSL side something that matches the RSL receive unit data indication template with those specific parameters, such as channel number, link identifier, and layer three message, then we set the verdict to pass because that's actually what we are testing for. So this test is basically, we have Osmo BTS in the middle and we attach to the RSL side of Osmo BTS and we attach to the layer one side of Osmo BTS by means of using TRX con fake TRX on the other side. So we basically can behave like a phone towards the BTS and we can behave like a BSD towards the BTS. And we send something on the, on the UM side and we expect this to be translated to an ABIS RSL message on the ABIS side. That's what we do. If you receive anything else, we repeat. So basically we ignore any crap that the PTS is sending us, but uh, we, we make sure that we receive that one uh, particular um, message that we, we send a message here and we expect to receive it on the other side of the BTS. And then we call some helper functions to deactivate at the end and that's it. So um, that's sort of how test cases look like. I don't want to spend more time here right now because we have get you, yeah. Um, that's, I have implemented timeouts, yes, on a global level. So if we, we have, uh, I have a timer here, a guard timer, uh, the, the t g, g t guard, as a g is the convention again that I use for global variables. Um, and if we look at the g t guard, um, there's an alt step for the t guard timer. Um, that's one of these, well, whenever this happens in the background and we activate that in the initialization code somewhere. Um, yeah, there's here uh, the handler initialization function that says, well, start the, uh, the T guard timer and activate that default uh, alt step. So basically, whenever this guard timer in the background will expire, it will call that alt step. I mean, that alt step, um, if we go back to that, it, uh, it will set the verdict fail and it will say self stop to terminate the component, basically. So that's what I'm saying. I mean, uh, you don't need to rewrite that all the time, but you just do that once and it will run in the background and uh, you will uh, fail when it, when it fails. Okay, now, um, yeah, logging. Um, uh, as I said, lots of things get automatically logged. You don't need to um, uh, write that yourself. Um, so for example, any encode and decode operation can log the, the, let's say you're decoding some binary stuff, it will log your hex number of the binary and will log the abstract decoded value that after the decoding. So um, you can really trace the code uh, and any component sending or receiving something uh, that will be logged automatically um, and uh, you even have a log format tool for formatting the data nicely. Uh, we will look at that in the next example. So this is an example log output, which is very hard to read, but you can see basically here it says sent on GTPC 
to system blah 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 and GTP one control unit data. So this is uh, from a, from a GTSN test or something like that. It will it basically says we have sent this abstract message, um, and then it will actually say this message was mapped to blah blah blah, and this is the binary encoded part of the message that it has uh, generated. But this is not nice to read, so that's why there is TTCN3 log format, which will log it to you like this, which is really nice. So you get a JSON-like, uh, JSON-similar syntax uh, of the message. So it's exactly the same log files, just post-processing that will show you the message like this, and it's much more readable, and this is the, the binary outgoing message that it was mapped to. Um, uh, so that's what the log formatter is doing uh, to, to make it more human readable. Now, and then the, the next interesting thing is that uh, we have all the existing protocol encoders. So this is a list of, I'm not sure if it's complete, but it's uh, what I could find, uh, all the protocol encoding and decoding. And you see lots of uh, telecom related stuff here. So BSSAP plus is actually the um, GS interface. Uh, BSSGP is NS interface. This is A interface. We have um, a GTP uh, as used in SGS and GTSN. We have ISAP uh, for call control. We have LLC, that's GPRS LLC. We have all the SIGTRAN stuff, M2PA, M2UA, and so on and so on. M3UA, of course. Uh, we even have stuff like SMTP, MIME, Google Protocol Buffers, Frame Relay, RTP, SRTP, IPsec, um, whatever you think of. Even SMPP is there. Um, so these are just the encoders and decoders that will basically translate the binary to the abstract encoding and decoding. And then we also have protocol emulation modules, uh, many more, but those three are particularly used in, in the OSMOCOM context. So M3UA, SCCP, and, and uh, SUA. Um, and then we have test ports, uh, which you can use, um, for example, a Telnet test port that are always used for VTY. So all of our test cases they connect to the VTY interface of the program that we uh, run. And then I have some helper functions to basically say, well, uh, uh, go to the configure node and uh, change the time slot uh, uh, configuration or something like that. So from my test case, yeah. Um, yes and no. <laughs> uh, no. So. Um, it only, so S1 AP is defined in ASN1, so it can compile that, yes, but it only supports basic encoding rule. Yes, yes. Yes, it's possible, um, but just for the, um, uh, the S1 AP, S1 AP I think is a packed encoding rule, um, but um, Titan only supports BER, basic encoding rules. But what you do is basically you use Titan to generate the BER, and then you use some like ASN1C code to decode BER and re-encode as PER. But that's, it's not, it, yeah, it, it's ugly, but it's very simple to do because you don't need to write the code for that. Right? You have one function call for decode the BER, another function call to encode the PER. I mean, and for test, most test cases, you, you're not so worried about the performance loss at that point. Um, so it, it can be done. Um, and um, the, uh, uh, they have what they call mobile layer 3, uh, is what uh, Ericsson calls it. And mobile layer 3 includes uh, GSM, uh, UMTS, and LTE layer 3 messages um, encoding and decoding. Yeah, okay, further reading. So if you uh, want to uh, read some more stuff, I really recommend this tutorial. It has only how many slides? Uh, <laughs> so it's only 250 slides, but it's an excellent tutorial. Um, I can strongly recommend it. And it's even, uh, I uh, asked, and uh, they have now released it under a, uh, I think even under Eclipse public license. I think it's the first uh, presentation slide that, that I see under this license. But anyway, it's under a license now that we can reuse it. So the next tutorial or whatever I give, I can reuse all the diagrams that they have in there. Okay, good. 